I hope uh, my throat makes it through. I'm not sure if it's all um, catchy. I don't know. I keep coughing, so excuse me as we do that, as I work through the sermon today. In your bulletin, there's a blue sheet of paper. I encourage you to grab that and open it up. We'll start um, on the side where it says a BIC definition of marriage in response to Tony Campolo's recent announcement. A number of weeks ago, in the month of June, on two different Sundays, I put uh, little insert cards, uh, little postcard size, hot topic um, request cards. One of them that came in was this. It said, uh, please talk about the LGBTQ and Tony Campolo's recent announcement. So I'll start off by defining what that means. LGBTQ is actually, uh, there's actually many, many more letters that you could add to it, but it stands for lesbian, gay, bi, trans, and queer community. It's designed, or it's a a short-term label, to help us define those that fit within that community and in different ways. And so this morning, I want to address that. We've heard a lot about it in the news, especially with the Supreme Court ruling in the U.S., uh, allowing or mandating by Supreme Court law to allow marriage of any individual, regardless of sex, within all of the United States. We also recognize that 10 years ago, the same thing became legal here within Canada. So it's been 10 years here that anyone can get married, whether they are male and male or female and female or male and female within any of the Canadian provinces. Just happened and is uh, much more in the news in the last few months, or in the last few weeks, I mean, because of what happened in the U.S. And then the second part to that is a statement made by Tony Campolo. How many of you here know who Tony Campolo is? Raise your hand. How many of you don't know who he is? There's a couple. So Tony Campolo is an evangelical Christian that has done many, many different books and has written, uh, spoken a lot in various places. I've heard him in person several occasions, I think four or five now, where I've heard him speak in different ways. And he carries a lot of influence uh, within evangelical Christian circles in North America because of his emphasis that he has done in the last number of years of focusing on the words of Jesus and our social work, engaging with those who are in need in different ways. And so I want to address an announcement that he made that I will come to a little later in the message. Um, Gavin, if you want to throw up the the message slide, uh, anytime during the message, and at the end I'm going to address kind of questions and answers, and I hope to get to that and leave enough time that we can answer a few questions that you may have. You can ask them verbally, or if you don't want to do that, I invite you to text them to me, and you can text them at any point in the service. Um, I won't look at them until the end, and so you can, um, until it's time for the Q&A, but that's my cell phone, which is in my pocket. Feel free to text them if you have any questions. I may not answer all of them. In fact, I likely won't have time, Um, but I will also follow up uh, during the week. If there are questions that you have, I'd love to meet with you and talk with you about that. So I want to just work through a few things this morning. Uh, my wife was the first who texted me today. It had nothing to do with this, but in the middle of the service, just so you know, my phone does work. She wanted me to tell you that in the prayer time, it was I said she was sick, and she said all of a sudden people backed away from her because they didn't want to catch what she had. Um, she wants me to clarify, if she goes to shake her hand after, she's not actually sick. Something happened in her neck and in her muscles, and she's walking around like this, and she can't move or shoulder check or drive properly. So she's working at trying to fix that, but it's been impacting work and everything. So you're not going to catch it. She would still like to say hi and shake your hand after the service, um, but she wanted me to clarify. So my phone does work. She's not sick, and we're going to talk about uh, one of the hot topics in today's culture and today's time. It will be available. What happens here Uh, will be available on the website once we are able to get it up there. Or if you want to take home a copy of the DVD, let me know and we can arrange to get you a copy of that as well. And I would love to have conversations with you at any point in time. It's much more of a topical sermon, and so there are a number of notes and things that you'll find in your bulletin insert as well. But I want to start off with um, some guiding principles for us in our discussion. And I listed them there for you. So the first one in our discussion today, and with any hot topic that we will discuss, I want you to know that we believe as a church, and I believe as a pastor and as a Christ follower, that the Bible is authoritative, is the authoritative, 
and reliable Word of God. That what we have in our pews and what we hold in our hands, regardless of the version that we carry, whether it's our English version of NIV or New Living or ESV or King James, or whether it's the Spanish versions that we have within our pews, what is inside of them is God's Word. It holds authority and it's reliable. We can trust what's inside of that book. This is our starting point for all conversations regarding what God calls us to be and do and how he calls us to behave. We need to hold true to what's in this book, and we need to hold fast to it and make sure that it is our starting point for all conversations. I've spoken about this before in the past, and I know that others have as well. If you're curious, I can help you find some of those past sermons. Uh, one of the best places isn't a, one of my sermons, but I really enjoy the Alpha program and where he talks about the authority and trust that we can place within the Bible. It's a great place to go and look if you're questioning the authority of our scriptures, because he will walk through it from throughout history and show you how we can trust and rely on that. The second guiding principle is that we believe that the Bible is God's message of salvation for all people. The Bible contains God's message of salvation for all people. And it's that last part that I want to focus on today, and we're going to come back and talk about that a little bit more. That God has a plan to restore his relationship with us, with all of us that are on earth. One of the most commonly memorized verses of the Bible, you still see it at football games, on posters, sometimes even on people's cheeks. You'll see it all over the place in the world. It's John 3, 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That God loves the world, the whole world and everyone in it. But the verse actually goes on. Jesus doesn't end there. He continues and he says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. John 3, 16, 17, and 18. God's Son came to restore, to provide salvation, to provide forgiveness, so that we can be restored in our relationship with God. But not just those of us who maybe already have an inkling of belief. He says he came for the whole world. At the time that this was written, about 2,000 years ago, it was said to the Jewish people. It was actually said to Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader, who had come. And it wasn't just for him. The emphasis on the whole world would have, um, in a sense, caused them to, to open their mind to something new. That God wanted everyone, not just his chosen people, not just the Jews, not just the Hebrew nation that had followed him, but he wants to restore his relationship, the good and right relationship of his original creation with everyone. So for them, they would refer often to Jews, Gentiles, sometimes barbarian, or Scythian, slave or free, male or female. Today we have the same kind of divisions, don't we? They could be based on our country, our nationality, our ethnicity, or maybe our sexual orientation. It doesn't change the fact that Jesus came and provides a way for salvation for everyone. God so loved the whole world. And we believe this to be true, that the Bible is God's message of salvation for all people. The third guiding principle is that we accept the Bible as the final authority for faith and practice. You know, there are many things that we do as part of church tradition. Many things that we do within our church. The fact that we're sitting here in pews and I'm up on a stage raised up above you. I don't have a pulpit today. I have a table. Um, The way that we do our baptisms and the way that I do them is based on BIC tradition. It has nothing to do with what's in the Bible, dunking three times forward. These are traditions. These are things that are, are not found within the biblical precedent, some of them. Sitting in pews, baptizing three times forward, all of these things. Traditions are not in and of themselves good or bad. 
They can help show us things about our history. They can help us to understand God better in different ways. But we must agree and we must understand that what is in the Bible is the final authority for both what we hold to as our faith and what we do as practice. Now, God doesn't tell us everything, right? The Bible doesn't say we should wear ties or shouldn't. It doesn't say we should dress up or not. It doesn't say that we should baptize in one fashion or another as believers, backwards, forwards, once, twice, three times. But what it does tell us, we must hold true to as, a final, uh, as our final authority on faith and on practice. The reason that we need to hold true to this is because God loves us. We've already established that in reading John 3.16 and talking about that. And when God gives us something that is a guiding principle, He gives it to us not because He is some mean parent with a stick waiting, but He gives us guiding principles for our life because He truly loves you and loves me. It's because He wants the best for you and for me. So whether it is passages about raising our children, whether it is passages about money and debt, we all know that it's not fun to be in debt, right? And when God says um, being in debt is like being a slave to that person who owns that debt over you, it's absolutely true. You can't do anything until that has been paid off, till that debt has been paid. You are a slave to them, to your job, to whatever it is. These are true principles. God says to avoid these things because it makes everything in life a little easier. The same is true of our relationships, both with a husband and wife, with parent and child, within the church together, our family of faith. It's also true of our sexuality. He doesn't give us these guidelines, these requirements of faith and practice, because he wants to hold us back from something that is good and joyful and is the way he created it to be. Instead, he gives us these guidelines to help us understand that there is a better way, a way that creates more joy and more love and more acceptance and more forgiveness and more good relationship than the world around us may be living and may be following. When he says something within Scripture, when he talks about our faith, when he talks about how we should live, we have to trust that he has our best interests in mind. Because he truly does. He loves us more than anyone else in this world possibly could. Remember, so much so that in order to restore our relationship with him, he sent his own son to die for us. So when we believe that, we can also believe that the things he tells us to do or not do are for our own best interests as well, out of a heart of love. The Bible is authoritative and reliable. It is the word of God. It is the message of salvation for all people, and it's the final authority for faith and practice. The Bible is something that we need to hold true to. And these are guiding principles for us. And these are things that we need to understand in all avenues and aspects of life. The first thing that I want to do today, understanding those things as kind of a starting point, is declare or talk about, not declare, to talk about three different um, Articles that come from the Brethren in Christ Canada, BIC Canada's Articles of Faith and Doctrine. And I printed them right in your insert so that it can be clear. You can find these online, and the address is listed in the box on the right hand side. Under, uh, in the middle of the box, it says BIC Canada Articles of Faith and Doctrine, and the website address is right there for you. You can find them. It's about 18 pages or so. And all of the scripture that supports all of these claims is found in the last, it's about three or four pages. The last end of that document is filled with all of the scriptures of where the men and women that, that helped to formulate these doctrines over the past 200 plus years have compiled them and brought them together into this place for us today. And so thinking of the topic that we have, I wanted to define what we believe as a church and what we believe as a denomination based on these articles of faith and doctrine. And so I want to read through them with you so that we have a starting point. 
And most of what I'm going to say is kind of what we believe, and I'll comment on Tony Campolo's article, and then we're going to open it up for discussion this morning. So the first article, uh, uh, the first one that I want to read is actually found in section two of our Articles of Faith and Doctrine, and it's under the title of God and Creation. And this is one section within there. It says, God gave human sexuality a good place in creation. Being either male or female is integral to who we are in, and in our complementary way provides for the full expression of our humanity. God has given standards for expression of our sexuality that are necessary for proper relationships among people. Human sexuality is affirmed within the chaste single life or a lifelong marriage between a man and a woman. So my one typing error, it's either male or female. Human sexuality, the very last sentence, is affirmed within a chaste single life or a lifelong marriage between a man and a woman. Now we need to recognize that human sexuality, that part of us, is good. God made it that way for us. It's part of his original design before the fall. When he created man and woman, he designed us to be sexual beings. That's not only part of us, it gives us an image of who he is and what he has made us to be. But we need to recognize that something was twisted in the fall when sin entered the world. The Bible recognizes it, that this changed at that point in time, along with everything else that we experience within this life, is broken because of what happened. Our original design was a design of perfect. We read about Adam and Eve being standing there naked without shame, that something was different at that point in time. And it changed with the fall of man. But sexuality was given to us, was designed into who we are as part of God's plan. We need to also recognize that male and female, that being male and or, or female is part of the full expression of our humanity. And that it was after God created Eve and he looked at everything together, and that's when he declares that it was good. It was after the creation came to its final completion with man and woman, after both were created. And we also need an affirmation from God where he says that it was good within two avenues throughout Scripture. That there are some within Scripture who lived and were blessed because of their chaste single life, as well as those who live within a lifelong committed marriage relationship between a man and a woman. And that's the last sentence of that paragraph. Nowhere in Scripture, in the Old or the New Testament, is human sexuality referred to positively outside of a chaste single life or a married heterosexual lifelong commitment. In both of these aspects, in the Old and in the New, in whether it's Jesus or Paul or Moses, both of the, the chaste single lifestyle and a man and a woman married for life are lifted up and encouraged and blessed and talked about as being part of God's design. Everything else is left to the side. The next part that I pulled out of our Articles of Faith and Doctrine is Section 5. It's under the title, The Holy Spirit and the Church, and then The Life of the Church. And this refers uh, to marriage. It says, The Christian marriage ceremony witnesses to God's order and design for the union of a man and a woman in a lifelong commitment of love and fidelity. Vows are affirmed, and the marriage is celebrated in the context of the congregation, which is called to support the couple in their life together. This is our statement on marriage within BIC Canada. It's something that we hold to and we put on our own marriage documents when we marry people within the church. This is something that must be agreed to. We share and share with those couples what we believe and hold to as followers of Christ here at Massey Place Church. That's done before God, that it's a man and a woman who are working together in a lifelong commitment of love and fidelity. Jamie and I have heard, and I'm sure maybe you have heard too, but I've heard it from, as the saying goes, from the horse's mouth, 
uh, not couples that I have married, but people that we have know, known who as they're preparing to get married, she will say or he will say, you know, this is, they're going to be a good first spouse. It's not God's design. Definitely it's culture's design, right? Something that we have led to believe that, uh, you know, you can go and give it a try for a while. Maybe you'll figure it out by the second or third time around. But we believe that God designed it to be a man and a woman in a lifelong commitment full of love and fidelity. And, I need to add, supported by the church family. I don't think God designed us to live life alone. Married, single, doesn't matter. We are to be together in the body of faith. So many scriptures talk about how we must live life together as a family, as a body, as a community, and help and support each other in that way. This article here talks about that as well. And then the final one, it's under also under Section 5, but the heading is Mission of the Church in Relation to the World. And it says this, The church recognizes the place God ordains for government and in society. As Christians, we pray for the state and those who are in authority. At the same time, we believe loyalty to Christ and the church, which is transnational, takes precedence over loyalty to the state. What this means is that we hold what is in here to be true, far above whatever is designed or given to us by state, by our government. Local, provincial, federal, doesn't matter. If God says something different, that will be the truth. Now, we recognize that we prayed this morning in our prayer time for Christians that are being persecuted all over the world. They're holding what is in here above what is in their state. Now, we are truly blessed to live in a place where we can worship freely, where we can hold to what is in here and not be persecuted, for the most part, by the state where we live, by the government that we have above us. But we also need to recognize that even what's happened in the last couple of weeks, when the definition of marriage is changed by a Supreme Court, that doesn't mean that the definition that God gave us of marriage has changed. The government has changed what they think or will allow. But God's word hasn't changed because of a, a process decided by some Supreme Court people. The loyalty to the kingdom of God is above everything else. We do and are encouraged to pray and support our government. But we also need to recognize that God does not expect a secular government, which we do have, even though many of our leaders uh, proclaim and live out a Christian faith, it still is a secular government. And we can't expect them to rule based solely on Christian values. We want to encourage it. We want to work towards it. But we can't expect it to happen. In the same way, we must remember that the ways that God tells us to live, that we hold to within Scripture, are given to those who are followers of Him. And when we look around at the culture around us who have yet to believe or yet to understand, it's hard for us to hold them. And I think maybe we actually don't need to hold them to the same values that God has given his followers. Throughout Scripture, it says that you will be chosen, you will be set apart, you will be marked as different because of how you live. God isn't expecting the world to live his way until they come to know him and follow him. Our job is to live different so that we can look different than the world around us, so that we can answer the questions as to why we are ambassadors, why we are followers, why we are believers of Jesus, because they notice something different in us than the world around us. It's the idea of being in the world but not of it, being part of the kingdom of heaven, yet living in an earth, on an earth, where it's broken, but pointing to a better way. These are just three statements that I wanted to pull out of 
the Articles of Faith and Doctrine from BIC Canada to help you understand clearly what we believe as a denomination and what we hold to as a church as well in this regard. Now I have uh, seven different things that I want to move through really quickly, and then we'll have time for some um, questions. Some of these I've already addressed, but I wanted to get them on here. So they're in the top right-hand corner of your, of your insert. I wanted to mention again that God loves each of us. In reference to this topic today, gay or straight, it doesn't matter. God loves each of us. I listened to many different articles and interviews. Or many diff- I read many different articles, listened to many interviews, different sermons from people, and there was one interview with a lady who works with a, a Christian organization out of Ontario um, that uh, I, I have listened to a number of their different things and have some videos from them. But she was at a community um, a, a church gathering, kind of like a marketplace where they had all these different Christian organizations gathered. And she had on her billboard their, um, their philosophy is to engage with people who are in uh, the queer community to come and know, get to know Christ and find a church that will love them for the long haul so that they can come to know Jesus in a new way. And so she had John 3.16 written on a big poster as part of her setup on her table. But instead of it saying, God so loved the world, it said, God so loved the gay, straight lesbians of the world that he sent his son to die for them. And she said as she was setting up, she had four of the different booth peoples come and uh, confront her. And they said, you know, we really are offended by that, and we want you to take it down. And she said, uh, I took a deep breath, and I said, well, I'm sorry that you're offended by that, but you already know Jesus. This is for those who come in here today who don't know him. They need to know that Jesus died for them too. And that's the philosophy. That's the difference that we need to keep in our heart and in our mind. The second one, we are all in need of a Savior. In Romans chapter 3, you can look it up. God talks about, or Paul writes about how We all need someone who can save us. And again, it doesn't matter our orientation. It doesn't matter the sins that we have committed in the past or the present. We all need someone who can stand before God and say, I have paid for their sins. No matter what they are, we recognize that we cannot earn our way to heaven. We cannot become so good or so holy in our lifestyle that we will get instant access to heaven. No, we all need a Savior. We all need someone who can pay for the wrongs, covers us, justifies us for what we have done. It says, For we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. That Christ paid for our sins, yours and mine, and those who are different from us as well. Third, we are all called to become more like God. God accepts us wherever we are, but he never leaves us where we are. When we find his forgiveness, when we become justified in his eyes because of what Jesus did, and our acceptance, our declaration that Jesus is now Lord of our life, he then begins to work inside of us and change us. It's a process that we call sanctification. It's a long theological word that just says God will make you one step at a time more like him. More like you were created originally to be before the fall. God accepts us where we are, but he never leaves us where we are. And we need to recognize that that process is true. And this is how we view things, no matter how big or little the sin is. I don't think there's a bigger little in God's eyes. But sometimes it's easier for us to think, well, that's not too bad. It's still a sin. Jesus still needs to pay for that. And we still need to grow through that into something greater. We also need to recognize that some things in the Bible are cultural and some are transcultural in application. An example would be in Jesus' own words, and we'll talk about this in just a a few minutes in a little bit more depth. Um, In Matthew chapter 19, it's a passage about marriage where Jesus is being questioned by the Pharisees. And he says, you heard um, Moses gave you permission to to give a certificate of a divorce. 
And he, Jesus goes on to say, basically, that that was a cultural thing because you were hard-headed. But the true matter of the fact is much greater than that, that you shouldn't be able to do that, and I'm taking that away from you. Even Jesus himself recognized that some of the things that happen in the Bible, there is a trans-cultural principle that is applied today, and some of them were cultural for that time period. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, and I would love to engage deeper on that because that's a huge, huge question in many, many different ways. Number five. Now, this is a quote from David Gretzky. He came and spoke here last fall when I was away. Uh, he's a professor um, and now dean of the seminary at Briarcrest. And he wrote this on his Facebook page a while back uh, in regards to the decision made in the U.S. He said, Marriage is God created, Jesus defined, and spirit sanctified. He said, It doesn't matter how it is defined by the culture at large, it doesn't even matter how it is defined by the church or theologians. It is God created, Jesus defined, and spirit sanctified. We need to recognize that it goes beyond what we can say it is to something that God created and that he is still using today. God created man and woman to be together in every way. Helpers, relationship, love, sex, all of these things are designed by God. He declared it was good. He said it was something special in Old English as they began to know each other. Genesis 4, chapter 1, or verse, chapter 4, verse 1. If you read through all of the prohibitions in Scripture about marriage, sex, rape, adultery, um, and uh, sexual behavior, whether it's um, homosexual behavior or all kinds of other acts, you can see the importance that God places on the relationship between a man and a woman. It's extremely important to Him because there is something special about the marriage relationship and our own sexuality. According to God, marriage and our sexuality is vitally important to Him. And it's displayed throughout Scripture in many, many different places. And often it's used as a picture of His relationship with us. That's how important He, he, important he thinks it is in this way. The sixth number talks about uh, a, a BIC ethic or what's often referred to within uh, meetings that I've been at and within some of the information on our BIC Canada website as being a third way. And what this means in a third way approach is that traditionally when we look at something that can be as divisive as this topic, we would say, well, there are these conservatives over here, that they are very rigorous in their Bible and in their tradition and hold to it, but they turn off a lot of people. In fact, we may call them homophobic. We may call them bigots. There are all kinds of terms for these conservative people. The other option, or the second option, is these liberal people who um, may love and accept and, and bring in people who are hurting in all kinds of ways, but they have neglected some of the topics that God said were very important in the Bible. And in fact, sometimes they ignore them. Sometimes they say, God really didn't mean that, or that was for a different time, or we don't need to live that way now. And often we think that we have to choose between the two camps. What BSC Canada has talked about, along with many, many other people, is that there has to be a third way. In fact, it's more of the way that Jesus took, if we read the Gospels, with integrity. And within this discussion, I would say that the way to define what the third way means, and I wrote it there for you, is that we have the biblical rigor of the conservative camp with the welcoming embrace of the liberals. Both of these things are what Jesus told us to do. That we need to love those who are different and hurting and help and support. But yet, once they come to know Jesus because of our love and our action, they then become part of a place where we are held to a different standard than the world around us. Just because the world has changed doesn't mean that the Bible has changed. And just because the world is accepting something doesn't mean that we need to change our Bible to meet it. But we do, and we are called to love and embrace the world around us, without exception. On this topic, 
doesn't matter even of uh, spiritual beliefs as well. We don't believe with um, tomorrow night is the last night of Ramadan. It will be the night of power, and I encourage you to pray for Muslims in our city and around the globe in that way that Jesus would come and reveal himself to them. We don't agree with them, but we need to love and support and encourage them, show them the love of Jesus in a way so that they can come and experience him in that way. That is the third way. Now, the last one just deals quickly with Tony Campolo's announcement, and I do it because it was asked on the Hot Topic conversation. I put a quote from his letter um, on the quotes on the back of your page. And so in the middle, uh, not all the quotes that will be used or have been used are necessarily things that we agree with. I put it here because this is a common conversation or topic or quote that you may hear. But in the middle, the third one down is the quote from... I got this, and the web address is on the front page, along with the the Articles of Faith and Government. Um, But the address where you can read it directly from his own website. So it's not hearsay. It's not coming from someone else misquoting him. But you can go read his own announcement that was released. And he calls it, For the Record. I'm making it clear for the record this is what I believe. And it was on June 8th, just last month. In one quote in there, he says, It has taken me countless hours of prayer, study, conversation, and emotional turmoil to bring me to the place where I am finally ready to call for the full acceptance of Christian gay couples into the church. There's a lot more in the article that he talks about. The only mention of scripture is a mention in the first uh, paragraph or two where he talks about how we need to live our life based on Matthew 25, which says, uh, calls us to love those who are hurting. So it's, it's a good passage that talks about social justice, and it's true. It's something that we need to do. Those who are sick, those who are in prison, those who need us, we need to be loving and care for them, be God's hands and feet, if you will, in those situations. But at the same time, it doesn't say that we need to change what we believe. We need to love, no matter where they are and who they are, But it doesn't lead us to the conclusion that Tony Campolo has been led to. When you read through the article, there is no other mention of scriptures or reasons behind how he changed his belief. He says, in fact, at the end, he says, I may be wrong, but then makes a case by saying that we were wrong about other things in the past in the church as well. So he brings up uh, women in teaching worlds, divorce, remarriage, and slavery as ways where he thinks the church was wrong in the past and we've changed our mind. And he thinks the same is true of same-sex relationships and same-sex marriage in particular. Notice he does define it in the category of marriage. So when we talk about the cultural debate, there are different ways that we can move. It can be um, everything from promiscuous or free sex with anyone being allowed at any point in time. And it doesn't matter if it's male and female or homosexual sex, um, that being allowed. And there are some churches that would say that's not a problem. There are others that would move and say, well, it doesn't matter if it's male and male or female, female or male and female. If it's done within the confines of a committed lifelong relationship, that's more what God had in mind, they will say, which is the argument Tony Campolo is making here. And there are others who will make that same argument as well. And then there are some who will say, But the Bible says that all sex outside of marriage between a man and a woman is not the way God designed it to be. That's what the BIC believe. That includes the single life as well as the married life. So there are different arguments in this way and then different um, discussions that can be had. So I want to address his argument really quickly because it deals with cultural principles as well. And then we'll do any questions if you have any. And I'll be real quick. So, in God's original design, there was creation. And he said and declared everything was perfect, right? Including our own sexuality. Everything was perfect. Everything was the way he intended it to be. But when sin entered the world, we refer to that as the fall. And it came down to create a broken world. 
Now, when we enter into this discussions, as Tony Campolo has brought up here, about women in ministry, women in teaching roles, about slavery, even the discussion about polygamy or having multiple spouses comes into the same discussion because as a church, we are now at a different place than we have been in the past. With women in ministry, the majority of churches have come to the conclusion that God didn't design women to be treated in the way that they were in olden days. That it is acceptable for women to be in leadership and in different ways and in different places. And that there are differences between men and women, but God can use both however he wants. However, there are scriptural references that they would say the Bible has given us that lead us to believe that we should, we, that we have changed our mind on this category. Now down here, what was one of the results of the fall was that uh, men would rule over their wives, right? was a result of the fall. Is that not one of the things that God said? He said, because of what you have done, this will happen. We see that early on being down here, not up here. What does he refer to us as up here? Being helpers, helpmates, being partners in what God had designed and had planned. Throughout Scripture, we see God, and we can go back and look at all of the different references where he will say, over here he gives women rights under the law of Moses that they don't have in the culture around them. The prophets talk about the importance of women. In fact, even some of the judges were women, like Deborah. It didn't happen in any other culture around them. We see King David lift them up even higher. We see Jesus accept women into his inner circle and teach them, which didn't happen in any other fashion. One of my favorite examples is in Ephesians chapter 4, where it talks about wives submitting to their husbands. Because in our culture, our jaws drop when we hear the word submit, right? To them, in their culture, that wouldn't have been the thing that would have caused their jaw to drop. It goes on to say, wives submit to your husbands, and husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. That second part of husbands love your wives would have been jaw-dropping in that culture. Nowhere else in recorded history till that point in time, and there's an awful lot of recorded history of the Greco-Roman culture, nowhere else is a husband told to love their wife ever up until that point when Paul writes it to the church in Ephesians. Way above where the culture was at that time. I think there is an amazing argument to show how us following God eventually in this category leads us back to the way that he originally created us to be. So the idea of sanctifying, of becoming more like God's original design and original creation. This same story can be told of polygamy. Abraham had many wives, and it goes on up to where Jesus, in that same passage in Matthew 19, declares that God created a man and woman to be together. Not man and woman and woman and woman, but this is God's original creation. The same story can be told of slavery. When Moses gives rights to the slaves and even allows them a way to become part of the, the Jewish community of faith, it's way above the culture at that time and in that way. It changes everything. Women in ministry, slavery, polygamy, all of these things are dealt with as God bringing us a step at a time closer to the way he created us to be. Sex outside of marriage and sex outside of marriage in a homosexual way or even in marriage in a homosexual way is never treated any different. From the beginning of Scripture till the end of Scripture. It's always the same, no matter where we read about it, as being against God's original design and creation. Now, we can't say that it's new to our culture because it was actually more prominent in the Greco-Roman culture than it is in ours, including allowing them to, to not necessarily marry, but have lifelong commitments together. And it's written about and wrote about. And if it would have been acceptable in their culture, you can bet that some of the writers of the Bible would have mentioned it. But it's contrary to God's design from beginning to the end. So, 
I'm going to stop there for a moment. I have a scripture to wrap up with, and I've gone a little long. Some of the prayer requests went long as well. Um, Do any of you have any questions? We can maybe do one or two, depending on the questions this morning. If you don't have anything verbally and you want to talk to me after or this week, I would love to have a coffee and conversation. Number six. So on the back, I put some common questions that are asked because I thought it might help. Um, So number six says, can you be born with same gender attraction? And what about those who feel they are a different gender than the body that they are born with? I would say we all are broken. It's obviously clear from Scripture that because of the fall and what happened, We all live a broken life. We all have desires that go against God's original design for us. I don't think the discussion about whether people are are queer or not, have something that is different about them or not, has much to do with whether we think it was genetic or whether we were born that way or whether it was something that came because of our, our upbringing. None of that really matters if we believe that God died for all of us and that we're all broken people. Because we're all in the same boat. We're all held to the same standard, and we're all at the same place. And so I think it is possible. I don't know that. It's highly debated. But whether it is something we're born with or not, whether it's something that we bring on ourselves or not, or that is given to us through our upbringing or not, it doesn't really matter. We need to remember that it's not, even this discussion is not new to our time or our culture or our society. You can go back into the Old Testament and they were dealing with it even in the Levitical laws, Moses talked about everything from um, homosexuality to pedophilia to bestiality, all kinds of things were dealt with. This is the sinful, broken nature. And God still holds us to the same account. Uh, An example would be, if we believe that, as the argument can be made, that I was born with this impulse or attraction to the same sex. And and so I think it's God-given, and he must want me to live it out. Um, That would mean that anyone here who isn't attracted to the same sex, anyone here who is attracted to the opposite sex, I don't know about you, but most people I've talked to have desires. Lust is talked about within the Bible. God created us to desire and to have an act of sexuality. Now, that doesn't give me the free will to go and sleep with whomever I want. Even though that desire is God-given, even though that's part of how he made each of us, he still calls us to live to his standard. Even those, those desires were born in each of us, and we would talk about that. Uh, yes. Yep. So if they've had, what your question is, is if someone has had gender reassignment surgery and changed the physical sex of their body and then marries someone who is now of the opposite sex, it's a good question. And I'm not sure exactly how to answer that, except to say that um, I would come back to, again, we all live in a broken, broken world, right? And we all live the best we can. I think that um, we can f- begin to follow Jesus wherever we are, and where goes, what goes on from there, uh, he will call us to. And I don't have a good answer to say whether that's right or wrong, except that I think there may be an answer, and I may have to get back to you on that one. Russ. Yeah?
So you're saying if, if you've changed the starting line, so if we were born one way, or that's that's the, the original starting point, and we should go from there. That may be the right answer. Um, I have to think about it. Yeah. One final question, and then we're going to wrap up today, and this one came from text. Um, so if we don't believe that one sh- that we should do homosexual marriages in the BIC church, how do we justify divorce and remarriage even when uh, the divorce was not a result of unfaithfulness? Um, which is a, a good question. And there are, it's a whole additional topic, but it leads, it comes from the same basic uh, idea. And actually, I, I read about I read and thought more about this just this morning because I thought it wasn't one of the original questions, but it may it may come up as well. So there are a couple of ways that uh, divorce is talked about within the Bible. That being God's original design is for a lifelong marriage together between a man and a woman. But in both Matthew 5 and Matthew 19, Jesus talks about um, divorce and as well as marriage. And he talks there about a couple of different things, one being adultery, if there is adultery within the marriage, or if there is abandonment. And so I, need, I think we need to be careful that there are some marriages that happen, some marriages within society today um, that are ended, as I would say, um, frivolously or carelessly. It's a cheap divorce, if you will, that not much work was put into it. On the other hand, there are some that end with much pain and heartache because of what was happening. I think if Jesus were, if God were writing part of the Bible today, he would talk to us as a church about how we need to come along and side of and support those who are in relationships that are extremely damaging and hurtful. It could be emotional, physical, um, spiritual, um, all of these different ways that, that people, both men and women, many times women, get hurt within relationships. And we need to stand up, just like we need to stand up in any case where someone is being abused in any fashion, and we need to stop it. We need to say, this is wrong. Now here, Jesus, he gives the examples both of adultery and abandonment as acceptable ways if someone walks away from a relationship and leaves it. I think this also happens um, within relationships that are unchristian in their in their um, belief and up, upbringing. And so we can see um, it happen where people are abused in some way, whether adultery happens or abandonment happens. There is an allowance made within Scripture for that. And also in the past, remarriage has been taken off the table as well, saying that if you've been divorced, you shouldn't remarry. And I don't think that that's biblical either according to what I understand within the Bible, that remarriage is something that actually is um, encouraged by Paul in the New Testament, that for people who have had a spouse pass away or have had something happen in the past, uh, because it shows the story of restoration. It shows the story of how God calls us to, to into something greater as well. In their time, remarriage was an assumed part of society in Jesus' time. Um, and in fact, in the ancient, if you look at within the Bible and outside bills of divorce that specifically states that they're free to move on to a new relationship and a new marriage. Um, and I think that within our broken world, the ideas of forgiveness and restoration of grace and mercy are key parts of our witness and of the gospel message that take place both within marriages that have fallen apart and within marriages that stay together and work their way through those. Um, Yeah, I'm going to end it there. I think there are many, many other questions that we could talk about. Um, And I encourage you to text me if you have them and we can meet if you don't want to forget or just find me after the service. But I want to close today with a passage of scripture from 1 Peter. And I'm sorry we went so long. Believe me, I have six more pages that we could have talked about. So, don't be afraid to come and ask. In 1 Peter chapter 4, he writes this, uh, verse 7 through to 11. The end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply 
because love covers a multitude, covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If he serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So may God go with you today. May he help you to recognize that he has an answer for any questions that you may encounter, and that there is a place where you can find truth and authority. Go in his peace and with his grace this week. God bless.